Good morning, everybody. My name is Samantha Mirabal. I am with Melco's application team, and I'm here to go over our design shop talk today. I got a few questions that were sent in ahead of time. If you have questions while we're live, type them in on the chat. Um, don't send them privately. I won't see those um, until much later when someone gets them to me. But type them in directly in the chat, both on YouTube or Facebook. And if you see me looking off to the side, I have another monitor up to keep track of what's going on over there and that thing was supposed to be done before so it's cutting it'll be done shortly so hopefully it's not too noisy let me quick check both platforms are up awesome so i'm trying something new today i got someone should got me a pointer that ha highlights it so hopefully that helps a little bit in you being able to see where i click and things like that and where my mousey is um where's the chat there it is oh again it's not working I'm going to have to look at it on the feeds. Okay. Well, I can see the feeds. It's just a little harder for me to use. So, that's okay. Awesome. All right. Well, let's get going. So, let's see. Can you create a shortcut, a shortcut key to use the text tool? Um, similar to pressing T? Absolutely. So, how do we do that? So, open up Design Shop. And here tools accelerator editor so this right here will give you all your commands that there are right and there's a gazillion of them here so um, you'll find what you need where'd my text thing go my pointer why isn't it highlighted there it is okay so this will show all the different things and you basically would go through and find what you want and add a um, key for it. Now, I will say the text already has a hot key for it. It's control T. So you don't have to create one. It's already there. If you don't like that, if you want to do something else, you can create your own, but that's where you would find it. It's tools, accelerator editor, scroll down, find the command you want and then it will show you what it's currently assigned you can give it a new key and then assign it okay good morning john all right so hopefully this pointer thing is helpful but yeah that's the editor there's a whole bunch um, that are fun to use there so hopefully that's useful for y'all all right what other ones do we have Uh, is there a way to make the needle go down and stay down so I can determine how many clicks up or down without shutting down the machine and manually turning the rod? Okay, so you don't have to shut down the machine to do that. All right, all you have to do is hit the E stop and then reach up under the machine where the rod is and rotate it down. Um, when rotate it down, the needle will be down. When you're done, don't try to rotate it back up. Um, it's hard to do. Uh, just release the E stop by a slight turn and it'll pop out. So it's a slight turn to the right, it pops out. The machine will go to head up and you're ready to go. Another way you can always do that is go to tool, tools, maintenance, head timing. And in that screen, there's a bottom center. So you can tell it to go to bottom center from there and it will drop the needle down and you can do whatever you're gonna do with the, um, the presser foot. And then you would say head, head up and then get out of that screen. When you're in that screen, don't mess with the keypad. Um, that's a maintenance screen. It has different commands. So um, it rotates the hook around. It does all kinds of fun things that as a tech, I like. Um, but so you can use that. I would just suggest rather than doing that, since you have to go to the computer anyway, just hit the e-stop, rotate it down. And that way you don't have to walk around. And when you're done, release the e-stop. OK, so that's what I'd suggest there. Can you show? Um, can you show how to make the toolbar bigger on the screen, and then use bigger bars? Sure. So let's get back to Design Shop. Ugh. The pointer thing has to be up top, otherwise it doesn't work. Okay. Oh, how to make them bigger? So we're gonna go to Tools, Options, Preferences, and every time. That goes off of being, that's a bummer. So this particular app isn't working very well because when I'm in these screens, it quits working. All right, 
regardless, preferences. And then here we're going to change that to, I'm going to say medium, apply. And now I've got bigger icons. Cool. So that makes them larger where it's all bigger on the screen for you. So it's, again, tools, options, preferences, and then down here is where you would set that. Hmm. I don't see a way to make it say on top. Oh, well. Okay. What other questions do we have? Um, when I import SVG files in the design shop, they come through all distorted. What am I doing wrong? So SVG files, I see that sometimes as well. I think it's a conversion thing with depending on what, what created the SVG file. Typically when they go, you know, it looks like weird star patterns on the screen. At least it does for me. Um, when I do that, I just open them in Illustrator and just select everything on the screen, go control C to copy it to my clipboard. And then I go to design shop and paste it. Um, I don't, I have no idea why it happens, but I know that's what I do to make it come in correctly. Um, best I can guess is whatever software created it is non-compatible. That's my only guess. I don't know though. So I, I see it every now and then, not with all SVG files either, which is equally weird. And usually, almost always, when I open them in, design, in Illustrator or whatever, Corral, whatever program you're gonna use, I use Illustrator. Open them there, select all, copy, and then I paste them into um, Design Shop, then they're fine. All right, got another one. If I digitize something very tiny, I can't seem to grab it and move it to a different place because it selects a point, the start or the end. Yeah, so tiny things are always interesting, right? So let's see, file, eh, that was not a good, good example to open. Let's try another. Um, I don't like any of these. Oh well. All right. So when you've selected anything and you're trying to click something and it's not letting you, a few things, if you, all you're trying to do is move it around, you can always, on your keyboard, if you hold the shift key and click your arrows, so shift and arrows is what I'm doing right now. And notice that moves it small amounts. Alternate, uh, excuse me, um, shift and control moves it large amounts. Shift and alt is medium, if you will. Okay, so shift, control, shift with control, shift and alt. So you can play around with them to see it, but that will let it move. The other way you can always deal with it is, you know, you've got, oops, yeah, I know it's an old file. Um, you can zoom in and then you'll be able to select it because basically you got to get off of the wireframe and click somewhere off of it so that you're in one, some of the open space and that'll let you move it around. Okay, I'm gonna quick look and see if I have any questions. Okay, I don't see any, cool. All right, yeah, it looks like the pointer app is not compatible with Design Shop, so I'll have to find a different one. Okay, what else do we have? It works with this, but not that other. All right. Yeah. How do you create faux chenille style stitches to fill an athletic block or letter or shape of any kind? Okay, so I'm gonna show two ways to do faux chenille. One, you can do it with a Bermelana thread and set up on our machine, we have a specific feature to create kind of faux loops on top. And that's an entire technique we have some videos for it and some sample designs. I'll show you where to find them because I like showing people where to find stuff. Um, if you go to the Melco-Service site, click on the FAQ and pray, uh, I'm gonna do faux because I can't spell chenille. Aw. Is it not gonna, micro, I think it's called micro. All right, it's not faux, it's micro chenille. All right, so down here, there's a video on it. 
There's some designs, a bunch of different styles and other things. But here's what I wanted to show you. Down here, there's this teddy bear. So if you grab that design and open it, you can actually use this to copy properties to something else, right? So these are kind of your faux chenille layers, if you will. And then the rest is digitizing on top of it. So I'm just going to copy one of those and go to my faux chenille file. And I'm going to paste it. All right. So I just got that sitting there for the moment. So I've done a few letters already. I'm going to move on to the L and I'll show you what I did over here. So this one that actually I'll tell you now. So the A is already set up just like the faux chenille um, bear. So we're going to do that same thing on the cell. So I'm going to take the L and I'm going to apply a stitch direction to it. It's a vector currently. All right. So now I've got a complex fill, but I want these properties. So I'm going to double click on that and you'll see that thing is annoying. I'm going to turn it off. There we go. All right. So I've got this guy selected and right here is copy properties to clipboard. So I click on that. So it's these gears right here. Now I'm going to click on what I'm trying to copy it to. And this guy right here is paste properties. So now if I turn off the L, you can see this now has the same properties as this guy. All right. So that gives me, that's set up to do it with Bermelana thread and there's machine settings and whatnot. Check out those other videos, but that's how you can do it. Then I can take the same shape, hold my shift key and click on that single line. So I hold, held shift, which is add, clicked on the single line center and that adds a border to it. Okay. So now I've got my Bermelana type faux chenille with a border on it. Well, what if you don't want to use um, Bermelana thread? You just want to use, let's say, puff and regular polyester thread and just make it look like faux chenille, right? Make it look like chenille, but you're using, it's just a different technique. All right, so what do we do with that? Let me quick look and see if I got any comments. None on YouTube. All right, cool. So I did these guys. They're both done a little bit different but it's fundamentally the same technique. When you think about what, if you've seen those designs that are done with regular polyester thread, um, the reason it looks kind of like a chenille look is because all the stitches are in different directions. And what does that give you? That makes the light bounce off of it differently. Where if you think about a solemn column of threads, they're all nice and even. So the light reflects consistently along it. Well, when for lack of a better term, I think of it as scribbling. When you scribble all over the place, all the threads are in different directions. So the light's going to bounce off each thread differently. And that gives a different look to it, right? So creating these is a form of scribble scrabble <laughs> um, is what I did. So how I did these was down here. Um, so these are set up to be done as a puff design. You put puff down, you sew. Um, all the scribble scrabble and then you put a border on it like puff and that cuts your puff you rip it off so to start with i tried two different scribble scrabbles right i did this design this pattern right here and this pattern right there and that is as simple as creating a walk these are going to be decorative so remember when you're creating decoratives your start and stop have to be on the same horizontal line okay so i'm going to do a walk type normal stitch length, you want it large. You don't want tiny little stitches because this is going to go into puff and um, we don't want to hammer the puff down completely. We want it to be raised. That's what's going to make it look like it's a raised design. Okay. And then I literally scribbled. Um, so this one you can see I did like this, making sure I was changing the stitch directions, going back over. I started, I started with that and then figured that wasn't that wasn't different enough. So then I scribbled back over it with this stuff and I went, all right, well, maybe that's a pattern to try. This is another one. I did this as a single scribble, right? Literally, I just dragged, you know, clicked left clicks around, making them long enough so that I've got enough distance to get those 40 points in there, okay? So that it's not short stitches, all right? So there's two. So 
select that grouping, right click, save custom shape. And you guys know I like to do test. I save them under test until I'm happy with them. All right, so there's test one. Select that one, right click, save custom shape, test two, decorative. Okay, yes. All right, so E, we have an E. Let's go do it on that one. Uh, I want that, I wanna see it up close. All right, so I'm gonna add a stitch direction to it. So that scribble scrabble is kind of open, right? So when I set, I wanna kind of cover up the foam lightly first before I scribble. So my first step is gonna add a stitch direction and that makes this a solid fill. That's too dense. So I'm gonna turn off this auto, make it, I don't know, 10, eight, pick a number. Let's say eight, cool. So that's just kind of a open fill. It's gonna kind of give a blanket primer coat of paint, <laughs> coat of thread over it. Then I'm gonna take the same thing, copy, paste, control C, control V. But this time, I'm going to change it from a fill type to a decorative, a decorative fill. And we're gonna make the stitch type, test one. Oh, not pattern. Oh, well, there it is. Yeah, so there's my scribble scrabble on top of it. So then I can hold my shift key, click on there to get my satin stitch around it. Remember, puff, your density has to be low. Right, so my top stitch here would be closer, you know, 1.8 to 2, somewhere in there. And now I have a micro chenille pattern. So, you know, you can play with them. Um, remember when you're doing these like that, if you tried that and you didn't, you liked it, but you wanted it a little denser, you wanted to change the spacing, spacing and things like that, you can change them here. Um, or you can go draw another pattern and try it until you're happy with it. Let's see, do I have any comments so far? I don't see, cool. So those would be my suggestions, is either do it with Bermelana thread using the micro chenille technique, or if you're gonna use polyester, um, so what I just created, how would you actually run this? You'd put your puff down and you would run the entire design with the puff sitting on there and then rip it off at the very last step. So your base layer plus the scribbling and then the border is all on the puff. And all the stitches are in different directions so it's gonna look more like a um, chenille type design. So that's a fun way to do it. And you can do that with any shape. All right, what else do we have? Can you show how to dis digitize decor like this? Yeah. So fundamentally speaking, these are all, they can be done as um, a combination of freestanding lace and applique, all right? So if you look, I'm not, this one, I didn't have enough time to try to create something this complex, but essentially I'll show this type of thing here and we can talk about it, how you would apply it in this case. Okay, so here, all these fabric areas, so you can pre-cut fabric or let's say this entire center, because that actually looks like you can do this. I don't know. If that's fabric, then you've got to cut out a piece of fabric, put it there, and then do freestanding lace around it. Um, or you can just do this one open area and then do the entire center piece right there as a freestanding lace. Okay, so let's go look at this and hopefully it'll make a little more sense. Okay, where's my little example? Napkin. All right, I'm gonna turn off all this and start with here. So let's say I wanna create a 10 inch napkin, all right? Or I've got a 10 inch square. It's got my nice little mitered corners on it. And I want to add this that decorative detail around here. All right, so I drew some vectors. So this, this guy is 10 inches. I decided the inside area was gonna be around eight one and then there's a gap between it, all right? 
I like creating vectors just so I have stuff to trace. So these little squares here are just to give me a reference point of what to trace. So how would you actually sew this, all right? What I would do is I would sew, oh, you can't see that on the screen. All right, let me turn all this off. There. All right, so I would sew these placement, I would hoop Vilene. So Vilene is cut and wash, whatever. It's the fibrous type um, wash away, cut and wash um, stabilizer. It dissolves completely. Okay, but it's fibrous. It's not that really thick plastic that stretches. I find the violin tends to hold nicer when you're doing this sort of thing. Um, it's a personal preference. A lot of people use that Badge Master or the really thick um, plastic that washes away. It's just not my personal preferences. So I would hoop that and then I would sew these two lines. All right, this outer line is going to be just a guide of where you're going to set your fabric, right? And this inner. So if I turn on these two shapes, you'll see I'm, I drew this line here and this line there, all right? So you sew that straight into the violin. Then I'm gonna take my mitered square or maybe pre-bought napkin, if you will, and center it along here, right? And then I'm gonna sew this line right here. All right, so what does that give me? That gives me a big old thing sewn down with this rectangle, right? Really, you probably want to tack the action, so do a basting stitch over here as well. So I would change that to a basting stitch like 60. This one, I would do smaller, like 20. All right, so I've got a basting stitch to hold that napkin in place, and then I sew this down. Now I'm gonna grab my scissors, and I'm gonna cut along that line on the inside here, all right? So essentially, I'll be left with this tack down. So I've got a line, and I grab scissors, and I cut out along here. All right, well, now you can see the previous line that sewed on. So then you take either that same piece of fabric you just cut out or another piece, lay it over the center square, and sew again. So that's what this is, and that sews it down. So now you grab your scissors, and you cut the overlap that's hanging out over here. So basically we're, we're building an applique onto this. So now, once you do that, you're, you end up with something that looks like this. So you've got a napkin sewn down with an applique piece, you know, fabric just tacked down to your violin. So now it becomes, how do you digitize those columns and things through here, right? So I don't like those, those were, I deleted those, there we go. So this is what I did. Oh, did I delete my work? No, I didn't. Haha. <laughs> so it's basically we're going to be building a freestanding lace over here, right? So let me delete that for the moment. And I put these little squares here mainly so I have stuff to consistently trace. If I don't do that, I end up making one line here, one line down there, and nothing's even. So this is just so I have something to follow along with. So now it's a puzzle. How are we gonna get around it? We're doing freestanding lace, which means you have to have underlay that ties everything together. Otherwise, when you wash it, it's all gonna fall apart, all right? So I've got a walk stitch that I just went up, over, up, down, cool. And then this is just a single line center, which is this guy right here starts where that previous run went and it comes back and ends over here. So I did add some underlay to that, right? To make it so that that first running stitch is sewn over a little bit more. Basically, I don't want it falling apart, right? So on that underlay, I changed it to an absolute, made the density, made it a zigzag. So it's going over that center walk that we digitized manually, density at eight. So there's a few more stitches in there. All right. Well, I ended here, so now I'm going to go do the next guy. I'm going to walk down, over, up, and then I want to cover up and start building the satin stitches that are on the edges of those fabric. So there's that one. Starts and ends here. I'd go from there back down. I did my satin stitch over. And again, that's the same properties as this one. So it's got the zigzag 
So it starts here, ends there, but it runs back a little bit. And then I walk up, do that same bar over here, down there. And now I need to come back down to this point. So now I have a repeating pattern. So now I can take this entire segment from there to here, copy and paste and drag it down. And that's what I did there. So you'll see, I've got another group. There's the group. When I copy and paste things and I'm re doing repeating patterns like this, I tend to um, group them just so I can keep track of what belongs together. So that right there, if I just drag it over for you, you can see there's my repeating pattern. So I end with this guy here. Now I can copy this, paste it down, if I undo it, and all I did was drag it down. So again, I can copy this guy, copy, paste, drag it down, and just keep dragging it around. Well, what's fun? Think about this. That's a repeating pattern, okay? When you have repeating patterns, you can turn it into a decorative. So here, I took that repeating pattern, flipped it because these all the starts and stop have to be on the same line, remember, which they are. So I start there and I end there. So from the first element to the last, it started and ended. So take that, right click, save custom shape, um, save, give it a name and poof, you can then create it. So that can get you the bolt rather than copying and pasting a bunch of times. You can use that to get down. Now you still have to deal with the corners and you're going to have to do that manually. Um, but that can get you really quick just by creating one of the repeats. So, you know, I can take this guy and use that along the bottom of the napkin, for instance. Right? Along one of these lines. And then all I got to do is deal with the one corner. So when you're doing these sorts of projects, right, where you've got, you want to build some sort of column or thing, a gap with embroidery that's just holding together. So it's only thread that's holding everything together. You got to think about it's three freestanding lace where you're tying each side together, making sure you're running back over things um, so that you don't end up with where it just pulls apart. Okay. So that's how I would do this one. So if you look at the other pictures you sent, you know, that's all of these techniques right here. This guy, uh, I kind of created that for you. You've got to deal with the corner down here. Now these are different. These are holes, but I mean, it's the same general concept. So rather than bars across, you would do some sort of circle pattern. Um, this guy is, it's cut work. Well, it's kind of, it's, I call it cut work, but it's a whole lot of it. <laughs> um, you're basically going to cut out a bunch of holes and then do freestanding lace in your design, right? So you're going to tack your hoop, you know, tack your fabric down with all the shapes, grab your scissors, cut out the holes, and then sew freestanding lace in the negative spaces that you just created. Okay, does that, I hopefully that helps some. That's how I'd do it. All right, what other questions do I see? Oh, um, can you merge to column one? Uh, let's see, can, on YouTube we have a question. Can you merge to column one element? I converted a letter to wireframe and it splits the S into multiple segments. Um, no, well, yeah, it depends. <laughs> so you can merge fill areas. Um, Sophia, did that help? I mean, that's, that's how I would do it. Hopefully that I explained it well enough where you could kind of get the idea. Um, okay, so back to the other question. Converted, and it, you converted a letter to wireframe, it split it into a bunch of spots and now you gotta fix it. Okay, uh, let's see. Awesome, I'm glad that helped. Okay, so let's see. S, I don't remember. Let's pick a font that is likely to do that. These scripty ones probably will. That one probably, uh, no, that prop one probably won't. I'm, trying, I'm looking for one um, that might script where, oh, that one probably will. Right click, operations, 
uh, convert to wireframe. Let's see what we got. Yeah, so we've got two columns, right? So what do we do with those? If you're trying to merge those together, selecting them, you notice the merge key it doesn't work there because they're not fills. Um, so no, you can't merge columns, but you can take these both operations, change element type, change it to a complex fill, and now you can merge them. But it's gonna you're gonna have to add splits then and things like that. Oh, nit block, all right. But did you see what I did here? So columns, no, you can't merge those. The co it's fill shapes that you can merge, those wireframes. So you can convert it to a complex, but now notice that's kind of messed up. So how would I fix this? Well, I'd come over here and insert a curve splice, like that, and then fix my stitch directions, because, ew, I don't like it how it is. There we go. Oh, there. And then you notice we got all this fill through here. So who, like you guys can talk, I was like, who knows why that is? I've been teaching children all week. <laughs> uh -huh. All right, so remember that's being governed by this property right here, okay? So ways you can deal with that down here, there's the common auto split, which is pretty cool. Um, that kind of makes it look more satin-like but it also is dependent on your stitch directions through here of how clean it ends up looking. You need it really to be close to 90 um, from side to side. And then it does a really nice job of giving kind of that split down through there. So that's how I would do that. So let's see your knit block font. S. Let's change it. Knit block. Oh, right. Make it big, so, well, I guess we don't have to make it big. Operations, uh, convert to wireframe. And what do we have? All right, I'm gonna make it another color so I can keep track of what on earth is going on here. There we go. All right, so it's got a walk, it's got a column, a walk and a column. So it's, that was, it actually split it based on where the starts and stops were and how it was digitized, but Again, you can't merge those. You would have to come over here, operations, change element type, complex fill, replace, and now you can merge them. Except they weren't overlapping, so it didn't really merge very well. Let's try that again. All right, I'm gonna make this overlap the other one. So it will actually be able to merge. So I'm gonna take those two guys and merge. Now it's a single shape. So then I can go in and change my stitch directions to make it look more like what I think it should look like. Cool. All right, what other questions do we have? Except I broke it, that's nice. Ah, hey, this is a fun exercise. So when you see stuff like this, what do you do? So you got too many stitch directions and it's all competing with one another, right? So when you start seeing crazy stuff, it's like I've told it to do too many things or the underlay, all of that. So you would change your stitch directions on there and then your starts and stops. Yeah, so that's what I would do. I've been trying to show that the crazy stitch thing live forever and that's the first time I've been able to do it. <laughs> it's a stitch direction issue. You're t basically we told the software to, or the shape to do the impossible so it's like woohoo here you go. All right what other questions? All right um we don't need it anymore. Cool. Any other questions before we call it a day? Did a little bit of freestanding lace today. That's kind of fun. I don't see any others typed in. And let me make sure I got all my questions that were sent in ahead of time. We did all those. Wait, did we? We did. Cool. Those were all the questions I had sent in ahead of time. So I'll hold for just a moment or two to see if anyone else has any 
other questions typed in. All right. Well, this this weekend starts all the excitement for our family. Our, our, one of my kids does travel soccer. The other one is a crew rower. And we have two games in, across the state. And then another one has to be at a, or at a practice on a river here. And then my other kid wants to go do other stuff. So, yay, mom taxi. <laughs> Anyhow. Well, you guys have a fantastic weekend. I get to go finish my signs and probably go embroider a few things and call it a day. <laughs> so you guys enjoy yourself. Uh, let us know what you want to learn about so we can try to work on those. And hopefully these are helpful. And I will look for a different pointer app because that one quits when I go into design shop. So I'll have to find another one. All right. Have a fantastic weekend. I will talk to you guys next week. Next week I am aiming for Thursday. If all things go smooth, Thursday is when we're on for next week. So till then, have fun sewing, everyone. Bye, y'all. Maybe. There we go.